There seems to be no end in sight to the protracted misunderstanding between the federal government of Nigeria and the university teachers in the country under the ages of the Academic Staff Union of Universities. This week's press statement by ASU President Professor Abiodun Guyemi shows how much both parties in the labor dispute still need to do before a resolution is found. The general consensus is that students who have been at home for upwards of eight months now because of this problem and, and that, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic are the ultimate losers. So joining us now is Professor Munzali Jubril, the former secretary of the Nigeria Universities Commission. It's a pleasure to have you, Prof. Prof, make sense of all of this because it's like a ding-dong affair we don't understand with this eyepiece. And apart from even the educational sector, not extending the topic, eyepiece is already causing another impending strike with Pegasus. So it looks as though eyepiece are cross board Nobody wants it. But most importantly, the students are suffering. That is true. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it appears to me that the issues between the federal government and the Academic Staff Union of Universities have been more or less this, this, uh, substantially settled. What, what is outstanding now is the method of payment of the monies that government has um, agreed to pay uh, the earned academic allowances, 30 billion naira, um, and also the withheld salaries for six or more months for some members. Um, and it appears to me that with goodwill on both sides, um, this is not an impossible matter to settle. It's like you want to buy something from someone and you have agreed on the price and everything. It's just the mode of payment, uh, whether it is by bank transfer or cash, or check or whatever. I mean, this is, this is not a very important issue in the transaction. Uh, and I'm sure that just like um, early in the year, around February, uh, the, the president intervened by directing that the salaries of ASU members who had not gone on the IP, IPPIS uh, platform should be paid. And then the Office of the Accountant General um, decided to, to use that as an opportunity to get people who had not enrolled to enroll. And ASU members resisted. In the end, government said, find some other way to pay them. So they were paid without going on the platform. So I'm sure that this can also be done now. Uh, but as, as you said, the interests of the students should be paramount on our minds. And I think the matter should be settled um, as quickly as possible but it takes goodwill on both sides. Well, well Prof, ASU is uh, insisting that except the federal government adopts what it calls the Transparency and Accountability Solution, UTAS, and abandons IPAs, that the, in fact the strike will, do, will just continue. And as for the payment that uh, the federal government claims, uh, ASU President Biodun Oguyemi said, in fact, many Many of their members were not, in fact, paid. So how do we resolve this matter? Because there are some matters that cannot just be resolved almost immediately, it seems. Like there are protests about uh, end academic yes. allowances and also proliferation of state universities, issues that ASU uh, seems to be uh, determined about. OK. Let me begin from the last one, a proliferation of state universities. In a federation, where education is on the concurrent list, um, that is to say it can be legislated upon by both state and federal governments. How do you, <laughs> in negotiating with the federal government, uh, um, protest about states establishing you know, one university per local government, for example? That's, that's some, not something the federal government can, 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 uh, has any control over. Um, there are some other uh, platforms for example, the National Assembly or some other political agitation platforms or even at the grassroots level at the states where you can fight this uh, because we know that proliferation of universities is not good. But to put this as an item, it seems to me that uh, it's, it's, stretching, it's stretching the, uh, the negotiations beyond its limits. Um, the issue of UTAS, uh, it has to go through a process of vetting, uh, verification, and authentication, and, and this cannot be dictated by 
the author of the document, or of the software, it, it's something that could take maybe weeks, maybe months. So before then, uh, um, ASU members should be paid on whatever, in whatever way, uh, using whatever platform, pending when this authentication process will be completed. Um, I, I don't think it is reasonable to insist that you must only be paid through UTAS when UTAS has not gone through the proper um, uh, verification processes. Um, I don't know which other issue you raised, apart from these two, which I can re respond to. Thank you, sir. Sir, can you hear me, Prof? Yes, I, yes, I can. Okay. Yes, yes, I can. Well, ASA will claim that they are fighting for the children of the average Nigerian who cannot afford a private education and for whom foreign education is not an option. But they seem to be losing the battle in the courts of public opinion. There's a lot of resentment towards ASU, and a blame is being directed at ASU for being recalcitrant in the negotiations. For example, with one of the claims on the table now, 30 billion naira, ASU is insisting that it is devoted solely to ASU and not split between other university unions. What is your take on this and how ASU can carry the public that they claim to be fighting for along? Okay, well, you know, the, the actual money verified, uh, I believe for ASU members is 40 billion naira, but government said because of other commitments, it cannot pay that outright, but it would make available 30 billion naira. But remember that there are other unions uh, in the university system who, uh, which have been radicalized <laughs> by, 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 by ASU because they, 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 they take their cue from ASU. And strictly speaking, some of these allowances they may not actually be entitled to because they may be administrative staff or they may be technologies and so on. Uh, so they, 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 they probably just work um, eight to four uh, uh, normal working hours and they do, they do not put in um, any extra uh, work that requires to be paid for. Uh, but, you know, this is the game in the universities now that whatever ASU demands and succeeds in acquiring, the other unions also now also demand for it. Um, in my view, the share of the other unions would probably be an insignificant proportion of this 30 billion. And if I were to advise ASU, I would say, okay, as long as government acknowledges that they owe you 40 billion, if in the end all you are able to get out of this 30 billion is 25 billion, take it and move on. Because they are not denying that they are owing the other 15 billion. They will pay it in due course. And as you said, there is need for some flexibility on the part of ASU because um, if it is true that they are losing public support, then of course they, they risk um, being isolated uh, and uh, um, they, they risk uh, courting public hostility. So for this reason alone, I think they ought to go back to the drawing board and re-strategize and um, compromise, give and take, so that we can reopen the universities. But, Prof, uh, if, if I was to call the Sanu president yes. here, he would say, oh, you're quite dismissive of other unions by saying, oh, those ones, they're technologists. But you can't run a university without them, for instance. So don't they have a valid ground for this? And there's this talk about merging all the unions together, you know, as regards this money. What, what, what's your take on that? No, I did not dismiss them. They are very important. If, if you are a, a chemistry lecturer, for example, if you do not have technologists to provide technical support uh, in the laboratory, you cannot, you cannot handle these students because the, these tasks, some of them you don't even know how to do. If a machine breaks down, you may not be able to fix it. And you don't know where the reagents are kept and so on. So they are very important. But you have to understand that the main function of universities is teaching and research, and the people who do that are the academics. The other people are brought in to give them support. What I was saying is that, you see, the earned academic allowances are allowances for extra work because of shortage of lecturers, 
uh, so peop, um, each lecturer has um, an optimum teaching load that he is supposed to carry. Now, when he carries anything over and above that, he is entitled to be paid for that, ex for that extra work. And I'm saying that for the technologists and for people in the registry, it is a bit more difficult. It is a bit more difficult to uh, define extra work because most of them work the normal working hours of eight to four. But as I said, there is a tendency for them to say, well, we are also a union in the university system and, and uh, our, our people work in the same conditions. Therefore, whatever else we get, we also get. For example, sabbatical. Historically, universities have this tradition that when you work for six years, the seventh year you take as, um, uh, as, as uh, a paid leave and, and you go somewhere else to devote yourself fully to research. Now, I agree that this is not what my colleagues in the universities are doing. Instead of devoting that year fully to research, what they do is take a second job in another university where they will still be teaching full time and they will have little time to devote to that research. Okay, that's a, a, little, a little bit of uh, alteration of the original intention. But the, the non-academic staff unions now also go on sabbatical. So if you are a technologist and you go to another university to do sabbatical, what are you doing there that, that is different from what you're doing in your university? So this is what I'm saying. There is a lot of um, copycat action on the part of the non-academic staff unions. Well, Prof, uh, one of the items in the newspapers today is that uh, the federal government is uh, setting up visitation panels to the various uh, universities, and that this will be done in a matter of uh, days because the president has already given uh, approval. Um, should that be the priority now or yes. resolving the existing issues? And is there a role for parents in all of this? Because I've had so many uh, parents saying, look, they've had their children stuck at home for more than a year now. And it looks like some ch students will be at home for two years or even uh, more. Uh, if parents can play any role, what are the channels available uh, to Nigerian parents? Okay, well, uh, first of all, the visitation panels, you know, uh, the university system is unique in having its own checks and balances. It's a whole system. It's a package. And it, is a, it, it has autonomy. It is a, supposed to run itself uh, without interference. But every five years, the proprietor, in this case government, is supposed to set up a panel of independent people to look at various aspects of its um, management and to report back so that the proprietor has a sense of how it is performing or not performing. Now, uh, unfortunately, government tends to, not just this government, every government, tends to be so preoccupied with other things that they neglect this very important quality control uh, mechanism. And it, it, you know, one of the things you have to, one of the things for which you have to give credit to ASU is that they serve as the conscience of the system. And they say, look, universities are supposed to have visitation panels every five years. The last time we had visitation panels was in 2011, which is nine years ago. So they made it an item on their, of, of, uh, on their list of demands that visitation panels must be set up. And actually, this information about approval is about six weeks old or so. Uh, and and the, the list ought to have been released, uh, but maybe there are some logistic constraints because they cost a lot of money. Uh, on average, you would have about uh, seven members per panel for all the 44 or 45 federal universities. So it's, it's, and they will, they, they will be working for a month, for a full month. So, I mean, you have to take care of their logistics. So that could be the constraint that is holding it up. But it is, it is a legitimate... Uh, um, uh, uh, mechanism for quality control in the system. Now, um, it is not true that children have been at home for one year. 
I think the, 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 the current ASU strike was declared almost as the pandemic was uh, raging uh, in March. So uh, from March to November is not, is not one year by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I'm sure we are on the verge of settling this crisis. Um, I agree with you. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's a very uh, unfortunate incident that children should be at home. And uh, the government should, should have realized by now that, in fact, part of the reason why the SARS and uh, NSARS uh, protest had so many subscribers was because the universities were closed. So young people were idle and were looking for something to keep them um, occupied and uh, excited and, interest, and interested. So they, they, they trooped to it. Uh, if the universities were closed, maybe we wouldn't have had so many subscribers to the NSARS protest. So it's in everybody's interest for us to get back to work in the universities. Yeah. And uh, the role of parents, well, um, yeah, the parents do have a role. In many universities, uh, there is a parent um, association, uh, especially some of the state universities down south, uh, which the authorities of the universities encourage uh, to be formed, so that they would be uh, they would be they would be used to cons um, for consultation, especially when they want to increase fees or when they have some disciplinary challenges. Uh, then the parents are involved. Uh, but in the federal system, there is none, uh, except that there is um, the national PTA. Uh, and when I was in NUC, I think there was one, Alaji Ani Mashao, who was the president then of the National Parent Teachers Association. And we used to consult them on certain issues. Uh, parents do have a role. And for the visitation panels, uh, the general public, including parents, will be invited to uh, submit memoranda um, uh, for each of the universities that uh, the panels have been set up for. So parents can, can make use of that facility as well. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Chris Ngige, the Minister for Thank Labor you. and Productivity, has been quoted as saying he's considering taking legal action against ASU. What are your thoughts, sir? Well, you have to see uh, Dr. Ngige in action to, see, uh, to, know, to evaluate that statement. Uh, I, I have sat through uh, negotiation meetings with him, sometimes all-night meetings, and you wouldn't believe that uh, he, he, he wasn't a trade unionist himself. Uh, you know, in trade unionism, you do a lot of uh, bragging and... Uh, yeah, uh, you issue a lot of threats, but they are all designed to lead to particular outcomes. I'm sure that he, he means to intimidate and um, uh, uh, harass uh, the, the unions or maybe ASU into playing ball by threatening to take legal action. He knows the option of legal action is, is not an option because you file your papers and the judge says, okay, I will see you in three months. <laughs> so what happens? You just sit down waiting for three months. It could take, and then, you know, when you get whatever judgment at that first court of first instance, then you appeal, then you appeal. Before you get to the Supreme Court, it might be seven years, by which time, you know, the, the, the outcome would be irrelevant. So uh, I, I, I take it in that respect, that he's just trying to um, uh, intimidate them to, to play ball. Right. Uh, Prof, I just want to ask this. Yeah, we've been at, at, uh, students have been at home since the start of the COVID pandemic, like you state, in March till now. That's still a sizable turn, and I'm sure most of them are... <laughs> that's a whole academic that's a, session. That's a whole academic session. They've More lost or less. A, a whole academic session that they can't gain any longer, that their counterparts in Ghana gained, and they're graduating on time. Uh, just that for effect. But secondly... Is there anything on ground as regards the structure for online learning for Nigerian universities? Because they've been talking about a second wave. Even if they resolve the ASU on pass today and the second wave kicks in, university students then can't go back to school. Then learning is affected. So is this something we're thinking of long term? Yes. Is this something that the university commissions are thinking of long term? 
that we can have an online learning framework for students? Yes, well, yeah, um, I, can't, I can't speak on, on behalf of the Universities Commission because I am no longer there. I left there uh, exactly 19 years ago. Uh, uh, but I, uh, I can say from what I know that um, no federal university um, had the capability to move to online learning uh, when universities were closed because of the pandemic. But the private universities, especially the high-end private universities in Nigeria, which were already uh, utilizing the dual-mode system, that is face-to-face -face and virtual, uh, the week after the lockdown, they just switched on to virtual. And they actually finished uh, uh, that session the, the, uh, I think they were, they were about to, to have examinations for, for the first semester. They concluded that and then went into the second semester. And then when, when it came to the examinations, they gave their students the option of either going, uh, uh, taking the virtual exam or waiting until after the lockdown to do it face to face. And students chose as they wished. And now they have gone into uh, the 2021 20, session. So they haven't really lost anything. And this is because um, they already had the infrastructure that is very strong Wi-Fi for the university itself. And every student, of course, either has a laptop or a smartphone. And of, because they were already doing that, uh, even when there was normalcy, it was easy to switch. Um, I'm sure that in the federal system, this could be done as well, because although uh, the students are not, many of them are not from rich homes, as, um, as in the case of the private universities, but, but you will agree with me that most <clears throat> young people today do own a smartphone. Of course, the money for the data uh, to, to follow online lectures is not, is, not, is not going to be easy to find. But I'm sure that if there, if there was determination on the part of the universities and the, the funding agencies uh, like TED Fund, uh, I'm sure that this can be done. And, and I'm, I'm sure that um, everyone will realize that we should not wait for the next pandemic or the second wave to catch us unawares again, that we must put in place facilities because it doesn't cost an arm and a leg to put those facilities in place. Prof, just by way of uh, wrapping up, would there ever be a time when we won't have this perennial face off between uh, university unions and the federal government of Nigeria? As you say, well, it's because government does not uh, respect agreements. But are we ever going to get to a point? Because, I, I mean, I can't remember, uh, you know, too many strikes, in fact, that uh, we have had. And the person who pays for it at the end of the day are students and their parents and the rest of society. Yes. Yes, that is true. I, I think it is not impossible uh, with the right policies, with stable funding, and with government honoring its commitments, it is not impossible to have a stable uh, university system that is strike-free. What I would like to see is a substantial improvement in government funding. You see, there is an NUC document which um, established the optimum cost of university education uh, in the year 2010, both in Naira and in dollars, uh, for the various disciplines. And the cheapest disciplines, of course, are the humanities and social sciences grouped together. And that's about 350,000 naira in those days. And so, but if you take the dollar rate and you translate it into today's naira, you get, you get a sense. It's probably about, uh, about 500,000 naira. Now, if, if government could give this level of funding for all its students in the federal system, I think this would 
probably eliminate strikes and then give the autonomy to the councils to manage this money properly uh, and pay the lecturers competitive salaries. If you pay lecturers competitive salaries, you will make strikes and instability no longer attractive for the system. But now people feel, in fact, that ASU claims that lecturers in the polytechnics and colleges of education are better paid than lecturers in the universities. And of course, it doesn't make sense. Uh, and this, this is because the last um, review of salaries in the university system for academic staff was in 2009. And since then, no, more, no, no, no other review has been made. So uh, they, they are taking uh, less salary than their counterparts in, in the other arms of the tertiary education system. This is not acceptable. And also, when you look at other countries on the continent, uh, maybe Namibia, South Africa, uh, the ones that pay better, uh, I don't know about Ghana, um, you will find that Nigerian university salaries are no longer competitive. So these are all the factors that keep um, bringing instability in the system. But we need firm government action. If you sign an agreement, honor it. And if your own agency, the National Universities Commission, says this is what it costs to produce a good graduate, make that available. Yeah, but, quite uh, right, you know, quite right. yes, yes, yes. Quite right. Thank well, you. thank you very much, uh, Professor, for joining us on the program today. Thank you for your thoughts and insights.